Tenny, if you don't mind, if you would stand with me just for a second or so and let us read a little bit of the scripture here that he has for us in here. John chapter 19, verses number 28. And the Bible says, After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the Scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Now there was a vessel full of vinegar, and they fill, filled a sponge with vinegar, and put it on his and put it to his mouth. And when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Amen. Let us pray. Oh, gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for this scripture this morning, Lord. Thank you for what you did on Calvary for me. Lord, thank you for the way you've changed my heart, Lord. Lord, I ask you to bless us this morning. Lord, bless your messenger. Bless your word. Help me to deliver something, Lord, that would be pleasing to you, a sweet savor in your nostril, Lord, as well as something that gives your people some help this morning, Lord, and something, Lord, that I just plead that you get all the glory and honor out of. These things we ask, Lord, in your Son Jesus' most precious name. Amen. You can be seated if you would. So this morning, notice with me in verse number 28 here. This is something you and I should really understand and take to heart this morning. I'm sure you've heard this scripture probably many, many times if you've grown up in church as I have, or if you've been in church any particular time in your life. But uh, notice what it says in verse 28 here. Jesus knowing that all things were now accomplished. The word now there says it was done in his time when he was walking and when it right before they, they nailed him to the cross there, he said, now that all things were accomplished. The only begotten Son of the one true living God, amen, is now ready to say these things are accomplished. All things are now accomplished. They were accomplished then. Now you might say, Brother Walker, you're making a big deal out of that word now. But it's truly, we really ought to get hung up on that one little simple word now and the fact that he said it was accomplished. God said it was accomplished. The one that spoke everything into existence is there and he's saying, Father, now these things right now, not next week, not last week, not two weeks from now, not a hundred years from now. He said now they are accomplished. Amen. So this morning I have kind of an odd message for you this morning, but I think it'll be helpful and profitable for you. So this morning I just want to preach on a little while just the thought, and I'll go ahead and give you away my thought is the power of the cross. Not the power of just any cross, but the power of the cross. The cross of Christ. The power of that cross. It is so important for me to tell you this morning and to warn you that we live in a world where there's many other religious organizations that want to attack that cross. They want to make that cross look smaller and smaller in the eyes of the folks of the world. And you and I, we need to be aware of that fact. We need to be discerning when we see things coming at us that look like they're Christian, a lot of times they're not. A lot of times they are. Be watchful. Amen. So the question this morning, very number one, is who is he that's saying this? In John chapter 3, verse number uh, 17, the Bible tells us, it says, and this came out of the Lord Savior's mouth, right, on, right out of his mouth when he was talking to Nicodemus. He said, for God sent not, N-O-T, not, very simple. Didn't need to go to the Greek to help, have any help there. It said, God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world. Boy, that makes me feel a little better, doesn't it you? But that the world through Him might be saved. So that is the one talking here. The one that God sent not to condemn the world is the one we're talking about here. Hebrews chapter 1 verse number 4 it tells us that being made so much better than the angels He hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Amen. For which of the angel said, He at any time, Thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Amen. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten unto the world, he said, Let and let all the angels of God worship him. You know, the Lord Jesus Christ, 
when God brought him into the world, the angels were to worship him. It truly was. Verse number 7 tells us, And the angels, he saith, who maketh his angels spirits, and his ministers a flame of fire. But unto the Son, he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of, his, of thy kingdom. Amen. Jesus Christ is, He was, and always will be. Amen. He was the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end. The beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega. Before Abraham was, I am. Amen. That's who's saying this this morning to us. That's who's telling us this. Amen. Now all things are accomplished. Amen. The great I am is saying it. He truly is. God Almighty in the flesh. The one that spoke light into existence. Let there be light. And yes, there it was. That is who's saying it this morning. Number two this morning, despite what the world says, I want you to understand this question. Number two is, what exactly did he accomplish? Amen. Well, there's a many things that he accomplished, but I'll just give you just a little bit that I can figure out in my carnal mind for sure is number one is he came to teach. The Lord Jesus Christ, when He came and He walked and He had His earthly ministry, He came to teach. He came to help us. In Mark chapter 6, verse 37, the Bible tells us, And Jesus, when He came out, saw much people and was moved with compassion towards them because they were as sheep not having a shepherd. And He began to teach them in many things. Amen goes there. I'm great. I'm, I'm, I'm glad he's a great teacher. Amen. He showed us his strength and his understanding of our struggles. And he shows us that he understands our temptations. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse number 15, the Bible tells us, For when... For we have not a high priest that cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Amen. Amen goes there. Amen goes there. That's why it's important to finish the verse, if you know what I'm saying. Yet without sin. If I'd have left that out this morning, I might could have led you astray. Amen. He came to heal the sick, give sight to the blind, Men, the broken hearts. Amen. You know, it's amazing how God is still into that business today. It's not the TV preachers that can heal. It's not them at all. They can't help with broken hearts. They can't help with blindness. They can't help with any sickness whatsoever. Because if they would, they would be at the nursing homes helping people. They would be in the emergency rooms helping and healing people. They would be in the hospital with the lonely ones, one that are broken in spirit. That's where they would be doing the work. Why is that? Because God, that's where God would have wanted them, not on TV. Asking people for money. Amen. He came to heal. In Matthew chapter 15, verse number 30. Same verse as we stated before. He saw the great multitudes. He had compassion for them. He healed the sick and helped the lame. He truly did. Amen. He came to build a church. Amen. I'm glad he came to build a church. I don't know about you this morning, but to me that, that does my heart some good to think that that was one of his goals. One of the things he accomplished. He came to build the church. Amen. Not just any church. The church. Amen. He truly did. In Matthew chapter 16, verse number 18, the Bible says, And I say also unto thee, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Amen goes there. Ain't you glad I finished that verse? Because the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Amen. He came to establish His authority. Amen. I'm glad He came. I'm glad He established His authority. He truly did. Matthew chapter 8 verse number 27 the Bible tells us there. It says, But the men marveled saying, What manner is this man? What manner of man is this? That even the winds and the sea obey Him. Amen. Jesus had control of everything. He did. Amen. Why did He have control of everything? Well, because He was God in the flesh. 100% man, 100% God. I can't explain it, but I can tell you He was. Amen. He came to destroy the work of Satan. Yes, He did. 
And I remember last week we were talking about sin. When did sin enter in? I always had in my mind growing up that sin entered in when Adam and Eve did their thing in the Garden of Eden. But truly the, the devil was way ahead of them there. The devil was cast out of heaven because of his prideful sin and all the other sicknesses that he had and filthiness of him. He was cast out, but he truly was. That's where sin started. It started with Lucifer, the old snake. Amen. The old dragon, it surely did. But God sent his only begotten son, the only one, the one that's unique. There's none like him. No, will ever be another one like him ever sent. God sent that one begotten son in to destroy the work of that uh, Satan, the Arrakesh, the, the snake. Amen. He truly did. First John chapter 3, verse number 8, it says, For the purpose of the Son of God was manifest that he might destroy the works of the devil. Amen. Jesus also came to bring abundant life. Amen. I was in the restroom this morning. I noticed there's a there's a tractor on the wall in there, and it kind of reminds me of my my dad's tractor. And this kind of helps me remember this particular verse here. My dad's tractor is a, a John Deere 1010. So when I saw that saw that picture this morning, it reminded me of John 1010. Jesus came to bring abundant life. I am come that they might have life, and that they may might have it more abundantly. Amen. You know. God wants us to have abundant life. Not only does He want us to have eternal life when we leave up out of here, He wants us to live a good life here. He really does. He gives us some guidelines, some guardrails, and some rules and things that we can follow that will help us live a good life. But that was His goal. He came for us to have an abundant life. Amen. Not only that, is He came to give life eternal. Amen. He came to give us a place in heaven with Him. It's truly what He did. In Romans chapter 6, verse number 8, the Bible tells us, Now, if we being dead with Christ, and believe that we shall also live with Him, knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over Him. Amen goes there. Amen goes there. The Lord Jesus Christ took the fear of death away from a Christian. He took the sting of death away from a Christian. He did it. Amen. And He said, all things were accomplished, is what He said. Amen. He came back to reconcile fellowship. You know, God loves us so much that He wants fellowship with us. He sent His only begotten Son, the unique one, so that we can have fellowship with Him. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 19, the Bible tells us, To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto Himself, not imputing trespasses unto them, and hath committing unto us, the word of reconciliation. Amen. I don't know what about... That excites me. That I'm reconciled in, in the Lord. Amen. Through Jesus Christ. He came to seek and save what was lost. Amen. The Bible tells us in Luke chapter 19 verse number 10. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Amen. I tell you what, I'm glad He found me when I was lost. Amen. I truly am. It was He that took away the sins of the world. Not just my sins, not just your sins. His grace and mercy was such huge grace and mercy that He took away the sins of the world. Jesus Christ, the Son of the one true living God, took away the sins of the world. In John chapter 1 verse 29, the Bible tells us, And the next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, saith, and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Amen. Amen. Now something that really gets me this morning when you think about it. It's right before he went to the cross, he says, all things were accomplished. All things were accomplished. It was a success. Number three this morning. He said it was finished. What exactly was finished? Amen. Jesus Christ, the Son of the one true living God, says it is finished. Amen. The one and only begotten of the Father, Father full of truth and grace, has command of all things in earth and in heaven, is saying, it is finished. He had the glory of God 
to finish the work that God sent him to do. He truly did. He gloried in that. Gave God the Father the glory in the work that was sent. In John chapter 17, verse number 1, the Bible says us, These words spake Jesus, and lifted up his eyes to heaven, and saith, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. Amen. Amen. That's exactly what he did. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should have eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. Amen. And this life eternal, that they may know thee, only true God and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on earth. I have finished the work which thou hast given me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. He had the glory from the beginning, the Alpha and the Omega. All glory was His. Every bit of it was His. He had it with Him then. He, he should have it today. Amen. He provided atonement for all the sins of all who would ever believe in Him. Boy, that's a big statement right there, is it not? He provided atonement for all that would believe in Him. In Romans chapter 3, verse 25, the Bible tells us, whom God has sent forth to be propitiation through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for remissions of sin that are passed through the forbearance of God. Amen. He fulfilled all Old Testament Scripture. From Genesis to Malachi, you know, there's over 300 specific prophecies dealing with the anointed one that was coming. He fulfilled every one of them. When he says, it is finished, when he says, it was accomplished, that is exactly what he's talking about. From the seed that would crush the serpent's head in Genesis chapter number 3, all the way to Isaiah 53, all through it, when they talked about the suffering servant that was coming. Amen. He did it. And then in the way where John the Baptist even spoke of him, saying that there was one coming that was much higher than him, he truly did. Making a way for the Messiah. He was saying, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. He's fulfilled all these prophecies. He truly has. All of them were fulfilled and they were finished on the cross. Amen. Boy, that's a powerful cross this morning, folks. Very powerful cross. Curses as any man's ever hung on a tree. He did that for you and I. You and I were hung on the tree with Him. We truly was. Whatever sin we had and had now or when we do, he, or in the future, He hung it on that tree. He truly did. So now we know who He is. You understand that, I hope, this morning. Amen. And we know of some of the things He accomplished. There's a hundreds, millions, gazillions more. We couldn't even count them. We truly couldn't. But we know at least some of the things He accomplished. And He said it was finished. And we know without a shadow of a doubt His work is complete. Amen. His work is complete. It truly was. The world would have us to believe that the cross was a failure. That was quite a long introduction, I have to admit. Now here's really the crux of the matter. And I'm telling you this this morning to warn you. There are things out there that are trying to diminish the work that was done on the cross. If you were the devil, that would be the first way that you could cause people to fall would be diminishing that precious work that the Lord did on the cross when He said in his own, oh, out of His own mouth, it was finished and that all things were accomplished. If the devil's going to attack anything at all with good Christians and good families, that's where he start. Guess what? It's already happened to a lot of religious organizations this morning. It truly has. I don't know when it happened. I saw some stuff that, that someone had brought to my attention a couple of weeks ago that happened like two years ago where someone was saying that the cross was a failure. You and I this morning, I'd tell you right quick, I would never think of the cross as a failure. I couldn't see how anybody could even fathom the thought that the cross was a failure, but yet they do. Why did they do that? Because Satan has entered in and crept in unaware is exactly what's happened. I can tell you this morning, folks, that cross was not a failure. Amen. It was a success. 
The Lord said, it is finished. It is accomplished. Everything he was set out to do, he did. It was success. 100% it truly was. In Corinth, when Apostle Paul was writing to the folks there in Corinth, he wrote, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 17. Now, pay attention here because when I read this fourth verse here, it makes me understand what we see in today's world. It truly does. In verse 17 it says, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of non-effect. Boy... That's exactly what they're doing today in the world. They're trying to make that cross of non-effect. They're trying to make that cross to be nothing to you and I this morning. The whole world is after our families. They're after our children, our grandchildren, because they want them to see that this cross means nothing. But to you and I this morning, if we truly understand what the Lord said, this cross does not mean what they want us to think it means. In verse 18 of the same chapter it says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto them of us which are saved it is the power of God. Amen. That's a powerful cross, Amen. sisters, brother. I mean, it, it's a powerful cross. We don't realize how powerful it is. We might maybe never know how powerful it is, but it was powerful. Yes, it was. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and I will bring nothing to the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of the world? Hath God not made foolish the wisdom of this world? Yes, He has. Amen. We see it every day. Verse 21 says, For after that wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. Guess what? Let me finish this verse. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them which believe. I guess the world rises by this sweet little church here. They probably are going to the lake or they're going to a football game or whatever. I'm not throwing rocks. I'm just saying the world's doing it this morning. They're riding by. They're seeing us here. They see the cars in the parking lot. They say, those bunch of fools. That's what they do. That's what they say. Oh, those fools. Those fools. They just ride by. They're foolish. They're fool. But God expected that. God told us that's exactly how it was going to be. But you and I, we have to be careful. We have to watch when these things are coming to know that the cross is under attack. It truly is. For those religious leaders that stand up and say today sounds like the character that God was writing to us about in Revelation chapter, uh, Revelation chapter 13 verse number 6. And the Bible says, And he opened his mouth and blasphemed against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwelt in heaven. That's these characters. That sounds like to me who God was talking about when he wrote Revelation through John, the Revelator. You know, we shouldn't expect anything less from the world. We truly shouldn't. We shouldn't expect anything less from these followers of Balaam. One of these days, maybe I'll preach on the, the doctrine of Balaam, but everybody's running headlong into the doctrine of Balaam. They truly are. In Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 27, the Bible tells us, But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. Amen. The Apostle Paul gave us some interesting insight in Galatians chapter 6, verse number 14. He said he had nothing to glory in. He said, But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and unto the world. Amen. When Jesus said, It is finished, He wasn't kidding. Amen. He truly wasn't. He wasn't playing around. He was God. And there's one thing I know about God, that any promise that He's made, He's made good on it. Amen. And when He said it was finished, it's done. You and I have nothing left to worry about. Truly we don't. Amen. You and I this morning, literally if you think about it, we have nothing without the cross. Amen. We have nothing without the cross. This Bible is nothing without the cross. 
Absolutely nothing without the cross. The Old Testament would make no sense without the cross. Amen. Now the poor Jewish people, I love the Jewish people. We need to support Israel, of course. You know, they're still stuck in the Old Testament. They didn't accept the testator when he came. They didn't accept the Lord Jesus Christ. So they're still stuck back there. Guess what? It doesn't make any sense to them either because they don't understand it. They won't even read Isaiah. They won't do it. They're stuck back there. But without God doing what He did on that cross, this Bible means nothing to us. This whole Bible, every jot and tittle, leads up to the power of the cross and what the Lord did on that cross for you and I. That's exactly where it started and it ended. Amen. It is finished. Amen is what He said. We have nothing outside the cross. We have nothing there's no point to Christianity at all. There's no salvation in anything else without the cross. Amen. The cross is the end of the wrath of God for all sinners that believe. Amen. Let me say that again. It's kind of one of these things should have a little come on a little bit more like some of these Bible verses have here. The cross is the end of the wrath of God Amen. to all which believe. Amen. Those that don't believe, there's no end to God's wrath. Amen. That's the power of the cross. It is the power of the cross. Amen. God took the sins of the world with and anything that has been ever said and done against Him. And anything that's ever been said and done against you this morning. God took every bit of that. If you can think about all the crazy and the bad things you've done as a child, you can think all the things where you fall short during the days, where well, you can think when, when God calls you to do something or God gives you something to do and you fall short and, you, and you're disobedient to Him or you're disobedient to your parents, these things that you, the little white lies you tell, God has made arrangements for all of those with the power of that cross. Anything said and done against us, He's nailed it to the cross. He's nailed His only begotten Son, the one, the unique one. That's the one that was nailed to the cross. Amen. In Colossians chapter 2, verse number 14, the Bible tells us, blotting out the handwriting of ordinance that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. Amen. The one that said that is the one that said, it is finished. The one that wrote that to us through the Holy Spirit said, It is finished. He said, I have accomplished all things, Father, that you sent me to do. They were accomplished. Amen. That is the power of the cross this morning. That's a lot of power. Hebrews chapter 10, verse number 4 of the Bible tells us, For it is not possible for the blood of bulls and goats should take away the sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offerings thou wouldest not. But a, bloody ha but a body hast thou prepared me in burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin hath no pleasure. Then say, I, lo, I come. In the volume of the book, it is written of me to do the will, O God. Amen. He was sent to do the will of the Lord, for the Lord to make reconciliation, for a propitiation of yours and my sin. And he went and he did exactly what God had told him to do, for God to get all the glory, and God raised him up. He did. Amen. It was a huge success this morning. It was one and done. Now that's an important thought this morning, that it was one and done. You know, you and I think about it a lot of times too, and I know when I mess up, and I know how the Lord convicts me when I mess up, and I turn right around, and I have to ask Him to forgive me, but the good thing about that is, I, I'm, I'm good at repenting. A lot of times I'm bad at remembering, but I'm good at repenting when I realize where I've messed up. But the thing about it is, is I don't have to go get saved again because it was one and done. It was finished. Amen. There's nothing else left to do. He has to do nothing else for me. Amen. He said it was finished. One and done. Amen. He was 100% successful the first time. Think about it. 100% successful the first time. There was nothing wrong. How someone with our flesh could live a perfect life 
knowing all the temptations that you and I have and knowing that the devil had his way by taking the Lord up by spirit to tempt him in the wilderness for 40 days, knowing that he went through all that. How could someone with this flesh do that? I don't know. But he did. Amen. He truly did. I got all my faith in the fact that he did that. He truly did. Took all that temptation. Amen. And when I think about him going to the cross and how they beat the flesh off of his back when they were taking him up to the cross and how he had to carry his cross and, and in the eyes I keep thinking, playing all that out in my head and I'm like, how could someone see that as a failure? Well, I think I understand how they could see that as a failure because they can only see what they see. They have no faith at all. They have no understanding. They see someone killing somebody as a failure. That was the whole purpose of God to send His only begotten Son for that ultimate sacrifice to take care of the sins of the world. But the world, yes, they see it as a failure. How that spills over into these religious organizations, I'll never know. But I'm asking you this morning to watch out for it. Why is that? Well, like I said, he was 100% successful this morning. He truly was. You can take that when you can believe it. 100% successful the first time. Oh, but the next time he comes back, do you think he'll be successful? <laughs> He's going to be 100% successful when he comes back. Why is that? Well, he can't lose. I can tell you that. There's no way to defeat something that can speak light into existence. There's no way the devil has any bearings on anything the Lord's doing. The Lord is just letting it go. He's going to take care of it. All the trouble that the old serpent has done, the Lord's going to clean it up in just a matter of a little bit. He truly is. He's going to clean up the mess just in a matter of a little bit. He truly will. He'll be 100% successful. You and I as Christians this morning, we have no reason to worry. Amen. We have no reason to be concerned. I know the things going on in Israel or a little bit of them. I'm kind of one. I don't watch a whole lot of the news. But don't worry. Guess what? He's coming back and he's going to be successful. He's going to be successful. In Revelation chapter 19 verse number 11 the Bible tells us. This is John the Revelation. He's telling us what he was seeing. Amen. He said, And I saw heavens opened. Amen. And behold a white horse. Amen. He's coming on a white horse. He won't be riding a donkey this time. Right. Yeah, He rode a donkey last time. He was 100% successful. But he's coming back on a big white horse horse, brother. And you say, Brother Walker, do you think there's going to be horses in heaven? Well, you know, I'm talking about the one that spoke light into existence. Do you think I think he's going to have a horse in heaven? Uh, absolutely. I think he'll have anything in there that he wants. Amen. Anything that his will, it will be there. Amen. 100% successful. He truly will. On a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. When you read your Bible and you see the uppercase F and you see the uppercase T, the one that is called faithful with the uppercase F and true with the uppercase T, they're talking about the Lord Almighty, Christ Himself. Amen. He's coming back. He's going to be successful. And in righteousness, He the judge and make war. Well, I think we got enough people making war, but I'm telling you what, when he comes back that second time, there'll be the end of all that stuff. These people ain't never seen war till the Lord comes back on that white horse. It truly was. So this morning, let me leave you with this. God Himself said it was finished. I believe it. He was successful. Every scripture fulfilled. Everyone. And I believe it. Amen. He truly did. So if you're here this morning, maybe you've never trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me tell you. The Lord saw such a fellowship issue with you and I. You and I, after the fall of Adam and Eve in the garden, sin crept in and it's creeping in. It's getting worse. The Lord had, had seen this go on forever. He was really longing for fellowship with His people, all the people of the world. And truly, He made a way for us to escape the wrath, His wrath. God is a loving God. And yes, He's wrathful, truly, because He's a just God. But God loved us so much, rich in mercy, that He gave us an outlet. That outlet was 
was the Lord Jesus Christ. Through His precious blood and the things that He did on that cross, the success of the cross, the power of the cross, that is the only thing that gives you and I any hope whatsoever of living in eternity with Him. Now I tell people all the time, there's two places that one can go. You'll either go to heaven or you'll go to hell. The world's so hung up on trying to prove God wrong, they need to be worried more about hell and proving it doesn't exist, but they can't do it. They're so blind and foolish like the Lord tells us that they'll never see it. They'll never understand it. But hell is hot. Hell is real. If you don't have the Lord Jesus Christ's blood applied to your heart, covering your sin, relieved of those sins, you'll end up down there with all of them. And let me tell you, brother and sister, it's not a party as people think. I'm going to hell with my water pistol and all this kind of crazy stuff and gasoline. People say some of the dumbest things. I can tell you this, the Lord said it lasts for eternity. I want no part of it, amen. I don't know exactly how eterni long eternity is, but I know that it's long and it's forever. Yes, it is. That's no place for this boy. Amen. So when God gave His only begotten Son for me so I could have a relationship with God the Father through Him and relieve all of my sins, all the sin debt that I've racked up, amen, that's where I want to be. I want to be with the one that made it all possible. The one that hung on the cross and said, I accomplished it and it is finished, amen. So how do you do that this morning? If you're lost this morning, the amazing thing the Lord did for you is He gave you this precious blood and guess what? All you got to do is ask for it. All you got to do is call out on Him. It's whosoever will. Whosoever will call out on Him. It's not complicated at all. You don't need a doctorate degree or a bachelor's degree to understand any of it. Amen. Amen. That's all you need to call out on Him. Whosoever will. And God will relieve you of those sins. Believing in the death, burial, and the resurrection of the one true living God, Jesus Christ Himself. Let us pray. Oh, gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, thank You so much for letting us be here this morning, Lord. Lord, I'm grateful to be in Your house, Lord. I ask You for this Scripture to not return bored. Lord, I ask You to bless the message, Lord, to, in the hearts of Your people. Lord, I ask it to be something that could save the lost, Lord. Help the ones that are here, Lord. Let them see when these things come into them, Lord. Lord, to protect these people. Protect their hearts. Lord, protect their families, Lord. Watch out after their grandbabies, Lord. Watch out after their children, Lord. Keep them in the straight and narrow, Lord. Help them grow spiritually in your will. These things we ask, Lord, in your Son, Jesus' most precious name. Amen. All right. I should have planned a little better. All right, grab your handle if you will. Let's turn over to page 456, I believe he said it was. Come on, the altar is open. If, if you're not one that's come to the altar and pray, uh, just pray there in your seat. If you uh, here this morning and you've never trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, maybe something in the message this morning said something to encourage you or help you to come towards Him, I'll be here and be w willing to help you. If you're here, it's kind of an amazing thing. When I was a kid, I got saved at a very early age. I didn't tell anybody, but I did. I got saved. I surely did. I changed my, changed my whole perspective in life when I asked the Lord to save me, to protect me from the wrath that was to come. I truly did. So it's not one of these things we have to tell anybody. It's just a heart change. It's something in your heart. But this morning, if you're lost, don't leave out the door the same way you came in this morning. Sing with me on all your anxiety. 456.
righty, all hearts and minds clear this morning? So glad you're here this morning. I need someone to dismiss us in prayer and remember to pray for Brother Coon this morning, if you would. And uh, if you don't mind, pray for one of my friends, um, Tom Parks. He's going through a rough time in his life. If y'all have some time this week, pray for my good brother, Tom Parks. And also, I have a friend that has uh, arrived in England this morning, bright and early on an airplane. He is uh, one of the most interesting characters. One of these days, I'm going to ask him to come and give his testimony. But uh, he is going over there to street preach. Can you imagine that in a place you've never been? But he's going in there boldly with the Word of God to preach on the streets of England. So pray for my good friend, uh, uh, Mr. Why am, I, why am I not remembering names? Steve Duncan this morning. Yeah, I was trying to say Duncan Steve, but that's kind of tripped me up. Steve Duncan, pray for him if you would. All right. Brother uh, Adams, would you dismiss us in prayer?